Joy. 
Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels turned in on For the souls of all who come To the Father are reserved And the church of Christ was born There was fear in the flame Now the gospel truth of all Shall not kneel and shall not faint By His blood and in His name Man's freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me
This is the first time I've ever used this like this. <laughs> Good morning. Good to see everybody today. If, you, if I haven't met you yet, I'm Ralph Rittenhouse. I was pastor here for some time. Uh, left in 2015, moved with my wife up to Washington State, about 20 minutes south of the Canadian border. But every now and then I get a chance to come back here, and I'm so grateful to your pastor, Dave Hurtado, who invited me to come and speak as we begin the Christmas season which is for me the greatest season of the world and I understand it's not necessarily that for everybody but I understand <clears throat> you're looking for a gift this afternoon I know you are and uh, we'll pray for you and your, your 49ers uh, <clears throat> But this is a great season of the year for me. I love that. And I, I remember sitting in our uh, offices back in the back, the, the conference room back there, and with the staff one time. And I was talking about Christmas and how much I loved Christmas and looking forward to the season. And then one of our staff members, I won't name who it was, uh, said, I don't like Christmas. Really? I mean, it kind of shocked me, bud. Uh, that he would say such a thing like that you know wh why not and it was because some people have family situations that they're you know the strained family gatherings the awkwardness and the bouncing back and forth between uh, strange parents it's not it's not pleasant sometimes and I understand that and also because the Christmas season reminds people of loss and I understand that too because I lost my brother during COVID and then this past year I lost my older sister to our heart condition so I'm celebrating the first time without my older brother and my older sister. So I understand that too, and, and I realize there are different feelings and emotions that go with it. But still, what a, what a glorious uh, celebration and music we just had. Thank you, Kelly and worship team, for that. That was wonderful uh, to be able to sing and glorify the, the, the Son of God, the babe born in that manger. You know, Christmas is the most celebrated holiday in the world. Over 160 countries of the world have it as an official holiday. That's out of 212, I think, countries in the world. So it's a, a vast majority of people on the planet celebrate Christmas. Celebrate Christmas in... Sometimes it's not for the right reason, and we understand that. We know that it's been commercialized, and I have a pastor friend who has a message about the commercialization of Christmas and how grateful he is, because that allows us to walk into a shopping mall or a dentist office or an elevator and hear songs about the baby born in a manger. So it's a great season. It's a great season for us as believers to come together and to worship and praise God. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me for a moment in prayer, and then we're going to jump into our story this morning. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you called us here like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of believers around the world who are looking forward to the celebration of your son's birth. Father, for 2,000 years we've celebrated. And today we go back again and we revisit the story. We remember why it's so significant. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are here in this room with us and that you will open our hearts to hear your spirit speak this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last time I was here, I had a message planned, and I remember getting up here and about halfway through realized that I wasn't anywhere near my script and the folks up in the, in the booth up there having trouble trying to figure out where I am, and I'm going to do my best to stick with my script today. Uh, as much as I can. Um, there's a, a guy named Braun Barrier who's a spokesman for atheists in America and he was asked the question, do you know any of any people who celebrate Christmas who don't believe in God? And he said, well sure I do, I'm one of them. He said, I think it's a wonderful season, the holidays are great despite what the underlying traditions may be. But people celebrate in this country, about 90% according to statistics, celebrate Christmas. Uh, in this country, and Christmas is, well, maybe you've heard the, the term Christmas creep, and that's not speaking about a dreadfully ugly Santa, that's, that's the creeping of Christmas earlier every season, and 40% of Americans start buying their gifts sometime in October, and it's getting earlier and earlier every year as, the, of course, the retailers look forward to the, the sales, more than 40% of their sales usually comes in the holiday season, so they're looking forward to it, they're anticipating, and children anticipate Christmas because of the candy and because of the, uh, of the gifts, and 
And you know, dads look forward to Christmas because of football and food, and moms look forward to Christmas, well, they look forward to it <laughs> um, because they're cooking and they've got crowds coming in. And, and, but teachers look forward to it because they got some time off from school, and, that, and that's always good. The airports look forward to Christmas because it's jammed flights and lost luggage. California Highway Patrol looks forward to it because of jammed freeways and DUIs. But, you know, there are all kinds of reasons that the, the Christmas season is so different. But the most important thing is that baby. Born in obscurity, into poverty, uh, into a region of the world that most people didn't even know about at that time. And my page just went blank. There it is. Okay. This is going to be fun. <laughs> David, do you do this every week? I don't know how you do this, huh? Okay. We're getting close. Popped all the way to the bottom. I don't know if this is going to work. I got my written notes here if it doesn't. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't trust it. Okay. Anyway, Bethlehem. Bethlehem, a town that's, the, the word means house of bread. It was probably like a place you stopped because it was only six miles south of Jerusalem, a mega city in that day. And it, it's probably where you stop for a sandwich or something as you're walking or riding your donkey to or from uh, Jerusalem. This little town of Bethlehem. Significant, yes, in history because David and, and others uh, have ties there. But now special because this baby is going to be born there. But the story takes place that we're looking for at this morning. Luke chapter 2 verses 8 to 12. Uh, with a group of shepherds out on the hillside. The scriptures say, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the glory, Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find the baby wrapped in snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Now, I underlined in that, uh, in my version here, the, the words good news, because it, indeed, it was good news. This was good news. Um, good because Christ was God's son visiting our planet. Um, good because God had a message to send through him. And we're going to look at the message that today that the angel brought there to him. First, he says to the shepherds, don't be afraid. And that's part of the good news of Christmas is we don't have to be afraid anymore. We don't have to be fearful. It's interesting that every time uh, an angel seems to appear in the story, there's this first words out of his mouth, don't be afraid. He visits Zechariah in the temple and says that his wife Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And, uh, and first thing he has to say, though, is don't be afraid. And then he visits Mary uh, and tells her she's going to conceive a child. And, and he tells her, don't be afraid. And now he visits the shepherds and says the same thing. Fear not. Don't be afraid. I bring good news. This is good news. The Old Testament believers probably didn't perceive of it that way. Their idea of God was different than ours. Jesus came as a fulfillment of the person of God, the, uh, the understanding of who God was, but they didn't have that before Jesus, and most of them thought about God as the one who was angry with sinners every day, you know? They, they thought of God as one of punishment, and so when an angel appeared, that was not necessarily a good thing. Um, there was a bumper sticker I remember reading that said, Jesus is coming back, and boy, is he mad. You know, uh, yeah, well, there's a reason why he might be, and so there would be people who would fear and not look forward to his coming. I remember driving down a, 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 a highway here in, in Southern California, and I was, I was not paying much attention. Well, I, was, I was going to somewhere, and I don't remember where, but I was in a hurry. I was going a little over the speed limit, and I looked in my rear view mirror, and what to my wondering eye should appear, but little blinking lights from a CHP car, you know? And oh, my stomach did just flip that it always does, and I can't. Kind a case and I pull over to the side of the road and he zips on by off into the distance and I thought oh bless you officer <laughs> chasing a real criminal okay good for you <clears throat> but you know that idea that when something is coming and you're dreading it and fearful of it there is a not a righteous fear uh, but a fear of intrepidation and a fear of punishment and it blanked out again okay oh I'm coming back Appreciate your patience. I'll learn how to use this. There must be a secret methodology here. 
Anyway, um, anticipation of the moment, fear of dread. Um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. We understand that. We understand why there would be fear. But the last part of that last verse there was, but the gift of God is eternal life. And that gift is what Christmas is about. That's what the good news is about. There's a gift that is yours. And this is your best Christmas gift. And it's yours. You, you need to claim that. Um, good news of Christmas is your gift has arrived. Receive it. The fear of dying is one of the major fears for all human beings. Um, the, the shadow of death, but the, the psalmist would say, I, I, I will not fear the shadow of death, you know, uh, for he's with me. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, John, the beloved disciple, the one who self-proclaimed beloved disciple, says, we need have no fear of someone who loves us perfectly. His perfect love for us eliminates all dread of what he might do to us. If we are afraid, it is for fear of what he might do, do to us and shows that we are not fully convinced that he really loves us. John, who walked with Jesus while he was on earth, came to know a love that most of us didn't understand. Or people in his day certainly didn't understand about God. Jesus came to reveal who God was, and this love was there. We don't need to be afraid in his presence anymore. That fear generated by an intrinsic awareness of our own sinfulness, uh, knowing that uh, our sinfulness creates this expectation of judgment, apart from knowing Christ, uh, that's what we have to look forward to. But because we know Christ and because we have accepted him as our savior, all that we have to look forward to is this confident expectation of what he will bring when he comes. Unmistakably clear how much he loves us in the cross of Jesus Christ. He tries to convince us. He does something very dramatic. You know, I've often wondered why in the world did he have to do that? You know, send his own son to die and all of that blood and the beating and all that. He did something very dramatic to get our attention so that we would see how much he loves us. That's the good news of Christmas. But there's a second thing in, in that uh, verse, verse 12 of the passage. Uh, you will find the baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. I mean, he's saying this to shepherds. He's leading shepherds to find Jesus. He's already talked to some kings, evidently, through a star that they saw, and they're coming to see the, 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 the tri-styled as well, the magi. But he's saying to the shepherds, there, you can find him. And the truth continues today. You can find him. We can find him. He's made himself available to us. I understand that many Hispanics that are coming into our country, immigrating, uh, not only come into our country, a new country, but they also become Protestants, many of them, because they're looking to renew their life. They're looking for a new relationship with God, and they find it here and being taught here, and so they respond to that. They want a new start with God as well. Jesus came to make the Father known. Um, verse 11, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today. God came in human flesh to reveal himself to us so that we might know him better. Uh, the, the word Christ means the anointed one. Uh, anointing was something they did to priests and, and kings back in that time. And uh, oil was very valuable and then as it is now. And, but it also, besides medicinal um, attributes that they thought it had, it, it had some kind of magical sense as well because they thought when someone was anointed with oil, they would be released to embark on extraordinary uh, exploits and do unusual things. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23 says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. God wanted us to know him as he really is. Up to that time, as I said before, we, they had only known him in, in a limited way. But Jesus was the fulfillment of that characterization of God, who he is. He, he was an explanation of God. In fact, <clears throat> the Old Testament, uh, as I said, that uh, reminds us that the Lord is angry with the wicked every day, but uh, it says he in John 1:18, Jesus will make him known. The, the word there is exogemi, which is Greek for uh, exegete. Uh, exegete means to explain or to, to give the meaning of, and that's what Jesus came to do, to exegete God, to help us understand who he was. And so what do we understand about God uh, because he came? Well, we understand that we don't have to be afraid anymore. 
And it, we don't have to wonder anymore to either because he, he gave such a full understanding of God. Philip would say to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you, yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Later, or earlier in John 10, 30, he said, the Father and I are one. If you know me, you know the Father. So what do we know about God through Jesus Christ? Well, we know of his compassion uh, because he, he, he was the one who healed all the physical ailments of people around him and the diseases. We know of his power because he, he made, turned water into wine and then he walked on the water. We know of his universal love because of the way he, he loved not only the Jews but also the, so the Gentiles. We know of his forgiveness because he forgave his enemies and hanging on the cross, he looks down and asks the Father to forgive those who were his executioners. We know something about his nature. God is a person. God is a person, and think about how radically that concept is uh, among the religions of the world. What do other religions conceive? How do they think of God? As a person? No, not ever. Not ever. Uh, the Muslims would never call God Father. That's just not something they do. Uh, but Jesus taught us to call him Father. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. A light that will shine on all who live in this land where death casts its shadow. That's Isaiah 9-2, Old Testament verse. Well, what is light and what does light do? Light attracts our attention for one thing. Uh, I <clears throat> read this week that the University of San, uh, San Diego did a study and uh, you can see with the human eye a headlight of a car 125 miles away. Now, it's hard to imagine, but I've been in West Texas. If you didn't went to West Texas on those long roads, they're straight. There's no curves at all and no bumps or anything. They're just straight, flat roads. You can, the longest one that you can see there is about 70 miles. But can you imagine seeing a headlight of a car 70 miles from you? An hour later, you meet it, <laughs> you know? I, I've been on that road. I know what that's like. You see a car way off in the distance, and boy, time and time, is, is, is he ever going to get here? Uh, light. Amazing how it illuminates. But that's what Jesus did. He illuminated God the Father so that we could see him. John speaking <clears throat> about Jesus being the light said, the light shines through the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Funny thing about light is light extinguishes darkness, but darkness does not extinguish light. You've got a flashlight at home, but you don't have a flash dark, do you? You know, wouldn't that be cool? You could flash it at something and then just, just a hole in the, you know, just dark. You don't see anything. Wouldn't that be awesome? We don't have any flash darks because light, dark doesn't do that. It doesn't extinguish. You, <clears throat> you go into a, a, a cabin up in our area, Washington, <clears throat> when it's really dark, you open the door and go inside the lighted cabin. They don't say, close the door, close the door. You're letting the dark in. No, that doesn't happen. Dark doesn't do that. Light extinguishes dark. You go down to the moaning cabins. You, many of you have been with the high school students on the Friathon in the summer and, the, you know, close to that lake, Lake Tulloch, uh, is our moaning caverns. And it's a cavern that's deep into the earth. You can, put the, you can put the Statue of Liberty down in that cavern. But you go down there if you're on the tour, and the tour guide will go down there with you, and, they'll, and at some point they turn the lights out. And you can't see. You can't see anything. You can't see your nose. You can't see anything. And then she'll strike a match. And all of a sudden, light in the entire cavern. Amazing what light can do. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to enlighten us. He came to show us where God was and who God was. He came to be the light of the world for us. Light overcomes darkness. Light overcomes darkness. And Jesus was born, and the light came into the world, and the world has continued to try to extinguish it. Herod tried to do it right away. He wanted to kill all the babies around Bethlehem because they, he wanted to extinguish the light. Later, Roman officials or leaders or, or Caesars tried to extinguish the light. Through history, those, there have been those who tried to extinguish the light. Back in 1956, Mao Zedong announced that there were no more Christians in China. No more Christians. He had extinguished the light, so he thought. But all he'd done is cause the church to go underground, and they found out later that 23,000, 23 million Christians were still living in China, and the number is still growing. No, we can't extinguish the light. Nothing can extinguish God's light. Um, but not only that, 
He said, you were included. In verse 10 he says, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. I don't care who you are, where you're from, what your background is, you are included in that. That's an amazing thing. That's good news. That's part of the good news of Christmas is that you are included. I don't know how confident you are as you sit here this morning about your inclusion in God's family, but you can be confident. You can be confident. Um, every Saturday this fall, I've been driving two and a half, two, two hours and 15 minutes each way to uh, Lakewood, Washington, which is a suburb of Tacoma because there's a Kenyan seminary there. Now you say, why is there Kenyan, that's what I said, why is there Kenyan seminary in Tacoma, Washington? Well, because Washington is one of those states that gives you green cards real quickly and they love to come, they come and they get their green cards and they can go anywhere in the world from there, or anywhere in the country from there, but they, many of them settle right there in that area of Seattle and, and South Seattle. And there they are, and, and a seminary in Kenya that has about six branches in, in Kenya opened up a branch in Tacoma, Washington, because there were so many Kenyans there. So they have a seminary there, and I go there and teach disciple-making every Saturday. Well, it's a crazy thing, and I have, a, I have a, a, a man who goes with me most of the time. His name is Frank Millward, uh, and Frank came to Christ um, I can't tell you how many years ago, he was, he was 22 years ago, he was a hopeless alcoholic. Hopeless alcoholic, had lost family, lost jobs, I mean, just, and God got a hold of his life, and he changed him. And now Frank is a 22 years sober and sane, you know, and, and Frank goes with me. Frank got into one of my discipleship groups when I first got up there, and, and now he has his own groups, and, and he goes with me to help as my teaching assistant at the seminary. And yesterday, when I'm up here, or down here, uh, he's taking the whole class. He and his wife Cheryl are taking the class. She's a converted Jehovah Witness. So they make a great team, and, and they're there uh, sharing the light at this seminary. Now, the amazing thing is, if you'd ask Cheryl or Frank, you know, 10 years ago, uh, tell them that they would be teaching disciple making to a group of Kenyans who are planning to go back to Kenya to share it there, they would have not conceived of such a thing. But God has in his plan a way of getting his light out, and it continues to spread all over the world. It's amazing how it does that. And here's Frank and Cheryl teaching in a seminary, teaching Kenyans who are going to go back to Kenya and share the light there. Jesus illuminated the path that showed us the way to the good news. Nairobi, Kenya is 14,000 miles away. Have you, have you ever gotten one of those mailings in the, in the mail that says you're the, you're the lucky winner of a million dollar sweepstakes? Uh, that dates you. I see you shaking your head. They don't come in the mail anymore, do they? <laughs> they come in the emails or whatever. And you get them three or four times a week almost, telling you you're the lucky winner. And of course you read the fri fine print and it says of the zillion people that we sent this to, you may have one chance or something like that. You know, wh what you do with those? Uh, well, you probably do what I do. You just dump them. Uh, but not so in this case. If it's too, if it's too good to believe, it's too good. If too good to believe, it's it's not gonna be. It's you know that's what we say, right? If it sounds too, it sounds too good. It's just not gonna be real. But that's not the case with Jesus. This always sounds too real to me. That I would be included. That I would be included. That all of these people that we're talking about here would be included. Uh, there was a, a woman at a well in Samaria, thought she'd never be included. Five husbands. Uh, there, was a, there was a tax collector in Jericho who wanted to see Jesus. He climbed up a tree to be able to see Jesus. He was included. There was a thief on the cross hanging uh, next to Jesus who pled for mercy and received it. He got the good news too. There were children that came to Jesus, and the disciples were trying to shove them away, but they were included too. They are part of this as well. There was a woman caught in adultery, and the Pharisees brought her to Jesus, hoping that he would help them stone her, but he refused. He refused rebu rebuking the Pharisees and refusing to condemn the woman. Why is it that Jesus would do this? Something greater than the sweepstakes. 
is ours because of that baby that was born. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The good news of Christmas is that it's for you, it's for me. We're all included. And all we need to do is open our hearts to the Savior, accept what he did for us on the cross, turn from our sin, become his follower. Uh, we're included. But the fourth thing I want to point out about the good news is that, that it's for all people. I bring you good news of great joy, which will bring great joy to all people. Um, how many of you have finished all your decorations? You decorated your house already? Come on, raise your hand. I know there's some more Christmas nuts out there. <laughs> yeah, bud starts when now? In August? Is there? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, why? We, because, because we want to celebrate this incredible thing that has happened. You know, we start right after Thanksgiving, and uh, I, I, I say we, Jackie and Chrissy, do the inside of the house, and Mike and I do the outside, and, you know, one of my favorite, most favorite Christmas decorations yeah, let's see where it went, there we are, we're back favorite Christmas decorations of course is the nativity and, and we have a nativity on the uh, mantle in our uh, bedroom, we have a nativity on the piano in the great room, but I put one outside I built one and put it outside in my lawn and I put a little light on it and there's my, there's my nativity and it's got Mary and Joseph and the little baby in the middle and a lot of the nativities of course will have some, some shepherds there and maybe even some kings or whatever but they will show you uh, all of these people that, were, that are included and brought to the manger because of the light that's there and because of the good news that's there. Kings and shepherds uh, know the good news. But Mary there is, is sort of an interesting figure to me because as I did some research on Mary, I found that Mary, this sweet and mild and humble little you know, Jewish girl, you know, a teenager, whatever she was, was really a radical activist and considered dangerous to many. In the 1980s, did you know that Guatemala, this, the government of Guatemala, banned the reciting of the Magnificat, which was Mary's song when she goes to see her cousin Elizabeth? the spirit fills her and she, she sings this song or, or, and the song of Mary there the, that they call the Magnificat that the spirit inspired is considered politically subversive uh, <laughs> here's sweet little Mary and she's, she's saying this thing and when it, what it talks about is of course the justice that he will bring and that, that kings will be brought low and that, that the hungry will be fed and, and raised up it, it's sort of a, a, a reaction and that Herod expected and that's why he tried to kill all the babies uh, it, that would, it, it was good news to us it was not good news to everybody tyrannical leaders this is not necessarily good news that this Messiah would become, this new king would be coming. She's talking about things that would be coming later on and things that she didn't even understand. But in Luke chapter 2, verses 52 and 53, it says, He brought down rulers from their thrones and lifted up the humble. He filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. For people in power, that's not necessarily good news all the time. Rulers are brought down and the hungry are lifted up. Um... Who, is, who needs this good news? Well, a lot of people I know need this good news. I know people who still have not embraced the good news of Christmas. Uh, children, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, who are in your family, who are in your realm of influence needs Christmas and needs to understand Christmas. Um, Herod was one of those cruel kings that ordered members of his own family killed because he was protecting his place of power. Um, but God sent the rich away empty, brought down rulers and thrones. Um, in Athens, when Paul visited that city in Greece, he is allowed to speak before the council of the city, the city council. And when he speaks to him, he says these words, he says, his, God's purpose, was for the nations to seek after God, perhaps feel their way toward him, and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. God's desire is that all people would come to know him. That's why he sent his son. That's why he revealed himself the way he did. That's why he did things so dramatically. That's why all the miracles were there. That's why the star came. He wanted us to see him and understand who he was. Uh, I've often wondered about those people who live in these far off 
villages in Africa who've never heard the word of Christ, who've never heard the name of Christ. Well, what about them? Well, I have an interesting take on that that I think I better understand now. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 29 says, if you see, God says, if you seek him with all your heart, you'll surely find him. If you seek him with all your heart, you'll surely find him. In 2 Chronicles 6, 9, 6, 9, 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God, if you're looking for God, is what I'm saying, if you're looking for God, God's going to find you. He's going to send people to you. And he's been doing that for centuries. People whose hearts are ready to respond. Now, the truth is, of course, most people are not responding. Most are like Adam. They choose sin over God, and they, uh, at the prompting of Satan, harden their hearts toward God. But those who sincerely seek him will find him. He promises that. That's part of the good news. Um, we live in a world of turmoil and fighting and killing and greed and every kind of sin, but God's message continues to go out person to person all over the planet. And I am in a particularly fun position to be able to see that sometimes. I get emails because we have a uh, global discipleship initiative, of which I'm a part, has a, has a website and a web presence. And we get, I, get, I get letters, I get emails. And I got one last week from a guy, and I don't know where he's from yet. I, he hasn't even, we were responding, we he wrote me, and, or wrote us, and now I responded to him and say, hey, if you're ready for a Zoom meeting, uh, let me know, and we'll get one together next week. But I get these frequently, and they're from different parts of the world. And last week I was talking with a young man named Kennedy who is in South Sudan. South Sudan, and he's in a village there, and he gets the internet, so we start talking on the internet. He needs Bibles, so I send him some money to buy Bibles because he's going to another village to share the message of Christ. And he sends me back pictures of how he's been sharing the message of Christ with people in this other, other village and, and giving them Bibles and teaching them how to have Bible studies. I, I just recently started what I call a CMG, a coaching microgroup, where I bring in pastors many times and try to teach them how to use these discipleship materials in their churches. And I, and I got a picture of, of, of a, this, one of these groups that I just started. I got five pastors in there with me. One of them, uh, the one on the top left, that's David uh, uh, Samuel. David is in, uh, in Tamil Nadu, India. Below him is Father Michael. Father is a converted Catholic priest who has now planted 27 churches in Sri Lanka. Uh, next to him is M Moses Dean, Pastor Moses Dean. He's in Malaysia. Uh, next to him is uh, Jackson Mo, who's in Myanmar. And above him uh, is Elisha, <laughs> Pastor Elisha. Uh, and I think he, and he's in Sri Lanka as well. So these guys, the, they have several things in common. Number one, they all speak English, which is good for me. <laughs> you know, I, can, I can talk to them on the internet. They all speak English, but they all are working with Tamil-speaking peoples in their countries. Now, we translated, uh, Dr. Samuel up in the left-hand corner, translated Discipleship Essentials, Essential Guide, and Transforming Discipleship, three of our books, into Tamil, which is the language there, and he's been using them. He trains probably 30 to 40 pastors every month. Many of the pastors in India and many of these countries, they're, they're the pastor of a church because they're the first one to come to know Christ in their village. So if they're the first one, they're the pastor. <laughs> and they have no training at all. And so he trains pastors every month. He's training pastors. These pastors who are pastoring little churches all over that area of India. And similarly, these other men. And, but I told Pastor Samuel after we got the material translated, I said, are there pastors other places that speak Tamil? Because I knew there were. I'd, I just had, the, I'd had some, somehow I knew. I mean, I'd heard him say that there were pastors. So he said, yeah, they speak Tamil in Sri Lanka. They speak Tamil in, in Malaysia. They speak uh, in Myanmar. They speak in uh, many countries. And so we, we got, the, got these guys together. We said, okay, let's get them together. Let's teach them how. Because they will be the ones bringing the light to these countries that don't have light don't have much light at all. And they will take it. And these men will do that. These men will be going back and teaching the good news about Christ and the good news about Christmas uh, and probably celebrating it just like we will here. They'll be celebrating it in those countries over the next weeks together. Wow, what a neat privilege we have. I mean, we can go and hear about Christmas and celebrate Christmas in churches all over town and all over our state and all over our country, these guys, it's not as easy to find 
these things. But God will, God will put people out there. God has people all over the world who are bringing the light to their areas. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Father God, thank you that you privilege us, born in this country, most of us, uh, living here now, with the opportunity of accessing the good news about Christmas, the good news about Jesus, every day, every week. There are places to go and worship. There are places to hear. But Father, there are people in very distant lands who, who don't have the opportunities we have, and yet you are faithful, God. You said if they seek you with all their heart, you will, you will help them find you. They will find Jesus. You'll get the message to them, and you've been doing that for 2,000 years. And we get to be a part of that sometimes. We get to pray for them and help them in various ways to be able to get the good news out there to the world. Father, thank you. Thank you for that privilege. Now, with your eyes still closed, heads bowed, if you're here today and you haven't been really certain about your relationship with Jesus Christ, that's between you and him. You can get that right in this very moment. Just say, Father... I want to know you. I, I hear about your son, and I want to know who you are, and I want you in my life. I want to know the forgiveness, and I want to be able to live in confidence knowing that my eternity is secure because of what Jesus did for me. So, Father, come into my life. Help me to turn away from sin. Help me to become the person you want me to be. Help me to grow up and become a mature follower of your son so that I might help others find the light. Father, thank you that you know our hearts. You respond to us because you love us. You prove that by sending your son. Thank you, Father. We praise you in his name. Amen. hearts men we can't give up what's the use they think we're crazy yes I see it but it doesn't negate what we know and what we've seen maybe we didn't see what we thought we saw Leo's right the more that we talk about it more people ask questions it sounds unbelievable even as words come out of our own mouths so let me get this straight what we experienced on that hill it was just a mistake, an apparition, huh? Nonsense. What we saw was a fulfilled prophecy right under our noses, men. It would take more faith to imagine that we were all suffering from sleep deprivation or we all ate of the same bad pot of stew than to just believe. We know what we've seen, we know what we've heard. God came near, men. Do not be afraid. That's what the angel said. That's what the bright light said. You know it. You can't forget about it. Do not be afraid. That's the story that we've been saying over and over for days. There has been weeks. If you put us in four different rooms and you interrogate us, we all have the same story. An interrogation is exactly what's gonna happen to us if Herod gets wind of this. Herod has killed for lesser things. Y'all remember when we ran to the barn? When we ran to that barn and we saw the baby, the Messiah, the story that we've been hearing about since we were children, the story that our great-great-grandparents passed down to us, didn't we know? When we saw that baby, didn't we catch an inkling of what, of what our mission was supposed to be? We are not just mere sheep herders. We get to tell the story, gentlemen. 
to repeat that a savior, that the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. The joyous announcement that is for everyone. Glory to God in heaven and peace on earth to all who believe. I believe, I cannot help but believe. Oh, come, all ye faithful. Oh, come, all ye faithful. Come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. My name is Jim Moyer. I'm one of the pastors here at Camarillo Community Church. And uh, today is the first Sunday of the month, and shortly we will be celebrating communion. But today is also the first Sunday of Advent. And this Advent season, we celebrate the appearance of the promised Messiah. It is interesting that the Messiah's appearance was not at all what the people of Israel were expecting or even knew had happened. God revealed this momentous event to just a few people. Of course, one of those was Mary, the mother of Jesus. An angel revealed to her that not only would she become miraculously pregnant, but revealed who her son would be and what he would do. Mary sings a song of praise in the presence of her cousin Elizabeth, we've already talked about that, about the coming Messiah. She starts with, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. And she ends her song with, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promises he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Later in Luke chapter one, Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, a priest, a Levitical priest of God, prophesied about Mary's son. He said, praise be to the Lord the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of his servant, David. And he has said through his holy prophets of long ago, he would have salvation from our enemies. And thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors there it is again promised to our ancestors and remembered his holy covenant the oath he swore to our father Abraham so the birth of Jesus fulfilled the promise of God you know the theme of the first Sunday of Advent is hope and our hope is in the faithfulness of God who provided a Savior as promised defeated the enemy and provided a way to be reconciled to him by the forgiveness of sin. And as we prepare for communion this morning, reflect on the faithfulness of God, that his promise is sure and that nothing, nothing will prevent his fulfilling his promises to us. 
it's a beautiful chance to remember the hope God brings to our lost and dying world. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your faithfulness and for the your promises are sure and that you're generous in mercy. Father, we pray, would you help us focus on you during these few moments that we eat and drink during communion, but also through this whole Advent season. Help us focus on you and to the life that you've called us to and that we can rely on your promise that you will be with us always, even until the end of the age. Amen. So we will sing one song, and as we sing, the ushers will distribute the elements where you are sitting. And as a basket comes by, please take a cup and hold it. Then after the song, I will come back up and, um, and lead us in communion. And we will all take, all of us together, we will take that um, communion together. And I will lead that after the song. So ushers, would you come forward? Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that we could, he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. So Jesus, during the Passover meal with his disciples, began a tradition that the church has followed for 2,000 years. And it 
hearts to help us remember his promise he made which is the basis of our hope on the night that he was betrayed Jesus took bread and after he blessed it he and giving thanks he broke it and said this is my body given to you do this in remembrance of me eat of it all of you in the same manner he took a cup of, of wine and said this is my blood of a new covenant do this in remembrance of me drink of it all of you What an awesome day. Um, thanks, Pastor Ralph, for preaching for us today. Um, if you were he here at the end of his message when he was praying, he gave an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you prayed that prayer today, if God's doing something in your life and you just surrendered your life to him and became a Christian, what just happened is you just were forgiven of your sins, you're welcomed into God's kingdom, and your next step is to begin to follow him with your life. Um, we would really like to be part of that. And I think a good thing to do right after you receive Christ is to tell someone. So if you're here in this room with us, if you, on your way out in the lobby on the left-hand side, there's a counter. If you can go there and let someone know what God's doing in your life, we'd love to be there for you and pray with you. If you have questions, we want to be able to answer them. If you're joining us online, go to campcc.net and click on Next Steps, and then we will uh, get back to you. There's a little form you can fill out, and we'll get back to you this week. All right? Um, we're going to receive our offering now. It's one of the ways we worship the Lord here. Um, and there's three ways to participate in that, as you can see on the screen. Whether it be um, giving online at campcc.net, clicking give, or you can text the amount you'd like to donate to 84321, or we have an offering box in the lobby. When you give here, it's how all of our ministry is supported. We don't receive, like, grants or government money. It's all through God's people. Um, and we... Um, as a church, uh, in our budget, we have 10% of our money going out to ministry around the world, to missions, one of which is the Global Discipleship Initiative, and Pastor Ralph, uh, we're supporting that ministry. So when you give here, you're also helping support Ralph. So we thank you for doing that. And before you go, let's check out this video of what's coming up next at CamCC. Hi, Cam CC. I'm Marianne DePuma, and I help surf in our high school ministry that meets Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. If today is your first time with us, we're glad you're here. If it's your second time, I'm so glad you're back. If you're a first-time guest, we have a $5 Starbucks gift card for you. Fill out our connection card and take it to the welcome counter in the lobby or scan this QR code in the phone's camera and let us know you filled it out digitally. Include your prayer request on that card as well. If this is your second visit, let us know at the counter and you'll get a $10 gift card to In-N-Out Burger. We will also invite you to our all-you-can-eat dessert with our pastors, elders, and staff. Online viewers, go to camcc.net slash next steps to go through the guest process. It's the Christmas season. I love Christmas. There are plenty of events for the whole family coming up. So start spreading the word, invite your friends, coworkers, and neighbors to join you. The month of December, Christmas at Cam CC. Saturday, December 9th, Camarillo Parade. Come watch the Christmas parade with your Cam CC fam and support our Awana Club float. The Lantana Gate will be open for parking access. Grab some coffee, hot chocolate, and movie style snacks in Fellowship Hall at 9 a.m. and then set up your chairs on Carmen. Parade starts at 10 a.m. Sunday, December 10th. We have our seven C's and Sunday school kids singing on stage, and they will be making ornaments in their classes. Get here early to get a seat. Photos and videos are welcome. Sunday, December 17th, come get your picture with Santa. He will be here. Sunday, December 24th, Christmas Eve gatherings, 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. These will be identical gatherings. Sweet treats, candles, carols, family photos in front of the tree in just 60 minutes. Child care is offered for birth to pre-K, as well as our rooms for nursing mothers and toddler room that allows you to view the gathering. Remember, Christmas is a time when the people in your life are receptive to an invitation to come to church. 
Grab some of these invites in the lobby and see who God places in your path. January 7th, Growth Group Signups. If you are looking for a way to connect with other people at CAMCC in a smaller scale for just eight weeks, this is an amazing way to do life together. Email lisa at camcc.net for more info. To stay in the loop of what's going on at CAMCC, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For more info on any of these events, go to camcc.net. Please stand with me for the send off. My name is Christine Benson, and I'm part of the Young Adults Ministry here at CAMCC. Something I got out of the message was, Jesus Christ came for us to make the Savior known. When you come out, into the lobby, there's gonna be some flyers that tells us what's gonna happen this December. Please get one so you know everything we are doing. If you need prayer over anything this morning, please know that there's a prayer team ready to pray for you. They're gonna be located right at the edge of the stage. Don't forget to grab donuts and coffees on your way out. See you next Sunday, thank you.